It's tough to find a fight scene with more props than this one from Rumble in the Bronx. So what better scene to study to learn how Jackie Chan foreshadows the props that are coming up in the fight scene, what happens to them afterwards, and how on earth the weirdest props manage to feel natural. One of the most overlooked details is that even if the scene has already started and there's already been an establishing shot, fights like this have their own establishing shot before they start. Once Jackie enters the area where this fight's gonna start, look at how many of the props you can already see. See the back room where the fight's gonna end up? You can see the pinball machines that get used multiple times, the West Terminal sign he's gonna jump over, the weird chandelier above the pool table, the pool table itself, this light box that he rolls over, fridges in the background, which we'll address again later, the chair this guy's sitting in, this guy's holding a pool cue, she's holding a pool cue, this other guy's holding a pool cue, pool cues get used, this hammock, even this post, and don't mind the arrow pointing to the shopping cart full of boxes full of bottles that'll come into play later, or will it? That depends on which country you're in. Closer shot of the first guy he's gonna face, and we can already see the prop he's gonna use, the closer a proper piece of the set is to being used, the more it gets interacted with. So the sound system gets thrown onto the pool table that they're going to use, and it hits the chandelier that's going to be a big part of the fight on top of the pool table. We do also see this footrest in the background for the first time. We didn't get a good look at it during the establishing shot. The closer a piece of the set is to being used, the more the frame it takes up. Notice how the post and hammock are pretty much the only things isolated in the shot next to Jackie. Lots of pool cues. Of course, we can see the electronics on top of the refrigerators way in the background. So the idea that you see something only one or two shots before it gets used is absurd. You're seeing stuff that's not going to get touched for another 50 or 60 shots. It seems natural for them to go up onto the pool table to do this one-on-one -on -one fight because it's sort of been the centerpiece of this entire area. Notice how the chandelier is in the shot when each of them goes onto the pool table. Before the fight even starts, the chandelier is taking up half of the screen. It's the very first thing that's going to get used, and director Stanley Tong framed this so that we can't look from Jackie's face to Tony's without looking back and forth across this chandelier and this giant piece of wood. If you've seen my video about Stanley Tong guiding the eye in Rumble in the Bronx, you'll recognize this tactic. Tony's body gets replaced by the lantern, and we want to look at Jackie's face, but it's hidden behind the lantern as well. So we don't have to move our eyes one bit to see this lantern once the shot starts. Now talk about foreshadowing. Tony almost falls off of the pool table, and right behind him is the row of pinball machines. Even though they're a little far away, it looks like if he were to let go of the chandelier, he would fall right onto them. It's a good detail that the pool cues aren't just hanging in the background. The person who pushes Jackie is holding one. Just like they foreshadowed when this part of the fight ends, it ends with Tony being thrown on to those pinball machines. And in this shot, we can see the next two props that'll get used. One by Jackie and one by stuntman Alan Sitt. A common thing I'm going to point out is that we don't only see the props that are going to be used in the future. We see a trail of them behind Jackie. We can see the pool table, the hammock, the post. Everything that gets used doesn't just disappear. We can see the glowing box that he's going to go over and the chair he's going to land in. Fridges in the background. We have seen these fridges for so long. We haven't seen this footstool in quite a while. It really does kind of feel like it comes out of nowhere, but at least it is sort of a natural thing to be there. It's not like he sat down on a chair and picked up a 2 by 4 In this reverse shot, there's that trail again. The pool cue, the glowing box, the pool table, the post, the hammock, the chandelier. This is a neat one. Instead of one fridge taking up more and more space on the screen as it gets closer to being used, a row of fridges takes up more of the screen. There is no way it should feel natural for a bunch of refrigerators to be in some little street gang's hideout, but they've been in the background since the establishing shot of the fight scene. By the time Jackie uses one, we're just kind of like, yeah, why wouldn't he use the fridges? They're right there. It's kind of a fun game to see how many of the things that have been used you can spot in the background. This is one of the few instances of a fight scene that actually has the different areas labeled for us to help keep us grounded. It seems like the gang raided an airport and stole all their signs, which is kind of neat and I guess weirdly badass. And lest you think the East Terminal sign came out of nowhere, no, we've been seeing it in the background since Tony started pointing guns. The dryer with the TV and stereo on it did used to be a freezer in a prior shot, but it was basically still a big white cube and you'd have have to pause it to really be able to tell that it changed. Talk about small details. Notice how we get a bit of this gray fencing here on the side? This divides the area Jackie's in right now from the area he's going to end up in later in the fight. This one shot beautifully sets up stuff that gets used in the very next shot. You can see the eye beams on the ceiling that Jackie's gonna use when he gets crushed against this fridge, or almost gets crushed. The electronics he pushes off of the washing machine reveal the TV and stereo that another guy uses. Guy grabs a stereo, tries to smash Jackie with it. Jackie rolls to the other fridge, which of course we've been seeing this whole time, does this cool stunt. Do not underestimate this detail of leaving a trail of everything that got used. Fridge he rolled down, fridge he was on top of, two eye beams that he used, fridge that almost crushed him, washing machine in the background, stereo that he almost got hit with. We are reminded constantly of things that just happened. This helps the fight scene to feel like a coherent story from beginning to end. What's he grabbing off of the dryer? It's actually TV that hasn't been there before. It's bigger than the ones that 
that were there earlier. But since we've been seeing TVs everywhere in this part of the set, and we saw TVs and a stereo on top of the dryer previously, it still feels normal that he picks up a TV that wasn't there before. I love that the fridges have progressed from using the fridge to hit somebody to using a fridge to trap a prop, and now it's going to be used in a moment to trap a person. They started with a small, more or less normal idea with the choreography and escalated it as the fridges got used more and more. The placement of the props in the set for this fight aren't perfect though. There was nothing on top of this fridge before, and now there's this empty TV frame. It's nothing important and it's just a minor prop that gets used, but clearly they had the idea for it after, and they still made sure to put it in multiple shots before it gets used. Unfortunately, the shopping cart does come out of nowhere though, and this is where we're gonna start including the Hong Kong version. So far we've been looking at the North American version, but here they actually took out a couple of swings when the shopping cart hits Jackie. He leans back and we can see the baseball bat in the background that he's going to end up using. However, that doesn't matter in the North American version because they cut this entire little spot out. I like it. I think that's a cool kick. A West Terminal sign and pinball machines mean we know exactly where we are. We already know we're back by the pool table without even seeing it. Hey, look at this box full of bottles. You remember these from this earlier establishing shot? Yeah, they don't come out of nowhere. Even when Jackie threw the electronics on the pool table, there's the box of bottles. However, it doesn't matter if you lived in North America because they cut the box and bottles out. As a result, in the North American version, it does feel like these bottles just magically appear on the pool table. Jackie's gonna end up in this back room where there's a bunch of TVs and sporting goods lined up along the wall. But earlier, that was a bunch of fridges. Maybe they just thought the fridges looked better in the beginning and planned on switching them all along, or they didn't come up with the sporting goods idea until later on and then they switched everything. Another baseball bat out of nowhere, but everybody in this gang has a baseball bat. This is the first time Jackie uses a pinball machine and as is the normal Jackie fashion, he gets hit by somebody else into the object before he uses it. Someone comes out of the room where we're gonna end up, which really draws our attention to the idea of using the doorway. And of course, in the North American version, they cut out a whole bunch of the pinball machine stuff where Jackie is sort of not moving forward and progressing. He's kind of getting stuck and overwhelmed. Notice how the doorway to the other room keeps creeping in from the left, taking up more and more of the frame, while the pinball machines are creeping off screen to the right, as we're getting to the point where they're not going to be used anymore. Jackie is pretty much already engulfed by the frame of that doorway that he's about to go through. We're finally seeing the cross-country skis in the background. Alan Sit does an amazing job with this hit. Look at how close this is to actually hitting Jackie in the head. Oh, way to go. And of course, when he's hit, he touches the cross-country ski that he's about to use, making it move to draw our attention to it before it gets picked up. It helps us to feel like not just that the prop didn't come out of nowhere, but the decision to use it didn't come out of nowhere. Another part of the fight completely cut out for some reason. Jackie exits that room back to the main area, and we're going to get something really cool. Check out this shot. If this was our establishing shot for the fight scene, this is our debriefing shot. You do not get that in a lot of fight scenes, do you? We can't see the pool table that was used, but we can see the pinball machines, the light cube that he rolled over, the chair that was used, although not in this exact frame because somebody's head's there, the area leading back to all the refrigerators, the TV area where he stepped on the baseball bat and kicked that guy in the face, the wall he climbed to come back over the West Terminal sign, landing on the pinball machines, going down underneath the pinball machines, back through this doorway where he got got the ski he's using now, and then back to his current position. This is an amazing debriefing shot, making one of the most prop-heavy fight scenes you will ever see feel grounded and somehow rational. Like, yeah, everything has gone full circle, we have a complete story here, and we're back where we started. Even here, in what are literally the final strikes of the fight scene, we can see the path back to the entrance of the hideout that Jackie used to get in here in the first place. We are literally shown the way out. If you thought this was cool, I've also done this entire prop foreshadowing thing with Jackie Chan's famous ladder fight scene from First Strike. 